Hi, I'm Chance Finucane, Chief Investment Officer at Oxbow Advisors. Last year at our Oxbow Summit presentation, we focused on the characteristics we look for in companies we want to invest in, as well as how we value a stock and under what circumstances we buy or sell a stock. This year, we're going to focus on the principles to our approach that have served us well this year, as well as why we're optimistic about our equity strategies looking out to the rest of the decade. But first, we think it's important to remind ourselves about some long-term trends that continue to affect the economy. The pandemic has been disruptive this year to governments, businesses, and families, but at some point we will get past it and things will return more toward normal. And when things get back to normal, it's gonna still be these trends that are impacting economic growth. The first is the increase in government and corporate debt on balance sheets. This trend actually accelerated this year as large companies needed to issue debt to improve their liquidity to try and survive however long this period lasts, and governments enacted stimulus measures to try and help families and small businesses. Rising debt acts as an anchor that tends to weigh down on economic growth, and from what we're seeing, it doesn't appear that this trend is going to reverse anytime soon. The second thing that we're following is the growth rate in the world population. Population growth is a key contributor to economic growth, but something that may surprise the average person is that the growth rate in the world population peaked back in the early 1960s at just above 2% a year, and it's been on a steady deceleration ever since. Today it's probably about 1% a year. So when we look around the world at major countries or regions, it doesn't appear that this trend is going to change either. So if we're looking at rising amounts of debt and slowing population growth, even when things return to normal, we think that global GDP growth is going to be slow and steady at best. We can look at this example of the United States to try and show how the periods have changed. So the lightly shaded bars here represent the percentage of the time that quarterly GDP growth in the U.S. was better than the forecasters expected. So from the 1970s to the 1990s, things were pretty good. But in the last two decades, it's been no better than the coin flip as to whether growth was going to come in better than anticipated. Our interpretation of this is that back in the 70s to the 90s, an investor could own some average companies and still get pretty good results because the economic growth was fast enough that even the mediocre businesses were going to do pretty well. But in the last 20 years, we think it's paid to own more high quality growth businesses that can do well regardless of what the economic environment is like. We've seen two precedents like this in the past that we think support this thesis. First is in Japan since 1990, and the second is in Europe since 2008. In both cases, the investors in higher quality growth businesses that are not reliant on economic growth have been the best performers. We feel fortunate that our equity portfolios have performed well this year in what's been such a volatile time. Our long-term growth and multi-cap portfolios, which can invest in any stock, have delivered double-digit gains year-to-date, and that's with about 30% of those portfolios on average sitting in cash. Our dividend growth strategy has a positive year so far as well, and we're happy with that considering that it's been the mature dividend-paying companies that have struggled with the pandemic the most. We think there are several principles behind our approach that have been big drivers of our performance this year. At the center of it all is free cash flow. We've included an example here for anybody who's unfamiliar with the term, but to put it simply, we think for a business owner, free cash flow is the most important metric and better than using net income that you would see on an accounting statement. Because in the end, free cash flow is what is retained by the business owner or shareholder after they've paid employees, rent, any materials, interest, taxes, as well as reinvested and any property or equipment to try and drive future growth. We want to invest in companies that generate lots of free cash flow and preferably have high free cash flow margins. So a free cash flow margin would be kind of like a profit margin but with a focus on cash flow of the business. Today for a large company the average free cash flow margin is about 9 or 10 percent but for the excellent businesses that we're looking for it's more like 20 percent or higher. That would be like saying that for every $100 in revenue that a company generates, at least $20 of that $100 is coming back to the business owner or shareholder for them to decide what they want to do with, which is a pretty compelling proposition if you're an investor. 
The first area where we apply this free cash flow is in relation to debt. We want to limit the number of companies that we own with high amounts of debt. We're always focused on survival first. We think in normal times, the average investor downplays the importance of financial leverage on a company's balance sheet. But once a recession hits, everyone gets real concerned about who can make their interest payments and who's going to be able to pay down their debt as it matures. We don't want to have those concerns. So for instance, in our long-term growth portfolio, if we looked at the ratio of debt to free cash flow of our individual companies and aggregated them together as if it was one giant company, it would only take nine months of the free cash flow from that portfolio to pay down all of the remaining net debt of those companies. We're far more comfortable in that situation than we would be in an index where the S&P 500 takes two and a half years of free cash flow to pay down its debt. It would be closer to four years for global stocks or as much as six years for the U.S. small cap index. Another way to look at debt is to focus on individual company credit ratings. When a company issues debt, they can ask a credit rating agency to ascribe a rating to their company, with the best being AAA, the lowest being about triple C or below. On this chart in the middle, the triple B is about as low as you can go while still being considered to be a quality credit. And anything double B or worse is going to be more speculative or junk rated. We want to stay well above that cutoff. And if you look at the credit ratings of the companies in our portfolios and average them together, every one of our equity portfolios would be rated between a single A and double A. We think it's pretty solid considering that that would be in the top 10 to 15% of all credit ratings on this spectrum. Besides debt, the other two factors that we think have been important for us this year is our emphasis on companies with above average growth and on companies with high free cash flow margins. We think companies exhibiting these two factors are characteristic of high quality businesses that are going to be less affected if a recession hits. And that's been the case this year. If we look at free cash flow for 2020, in the S&P 500, it's expected that those companies are going to generate 25% less free cash flow than they did last year. But for the 21 businesses in our long-term growth portfolio, if we take the weighted average using the position sizes we have in that strategy, that portfolio is expected to increase its free cash flow by 8% this year, in the middle of a pandemic that's been one of the most disruptive years for an economy in the last century. We're really pleased with that. We want to look more in depth into this concept of high free cash flow margin businesses from the investor's standpoint and why we think this is a good area to look for opportunities. To start out, it just has a terrific long-term track record. On this chart, the lightly shaded bars represent the performance of the large companies with high free cash flow margins relative to a total market index. The fact that every one of these bars is above zero tells us that it's outperformed in every decade going back to the 1950s. So that's a good starting point, but it also outperforms across a number of investing environments. So again, the lightly shaded bars represent your high free cash flow margin businesses. And they do best in what would be more of a normal economy, classified here as growth tilted or growth driven. But we're even more encouraged by the fact that these types of companies outperform even in a more volatile time or even during a recession, which would be signified here by the value driven or value tilted categories. We're looking for companies like this that can do well across an economic cycle because we don't want to be constantly turning over the portfolio, shifting from a cyclical focus to then a defensive bent and then back to cyclical because historically we think it's really tough to find anybody who's been consistently successful at doing that. We'd rather find outstanding businesses that can do well regardless of what's going to happen in front of them and we can just own them throughout the cycle. There's a multi-decade trend about cash flow margins that we think is worth pointing out. And that's that the free cash flow margins of the average business today are much higher than they used to be. If we look first at the chart on the left, from the 1950s to the 1970s, the average margin delivered by a large company was only 2%, which is not that good. But today it's expanded to the point that now the average margin is more like 9 or 10%, which is more appealing to any investor. But one layer deeper than that that we find even more intriguing is that for the excellent businesses to rank in the top 20% or what they would call the top quintile of all companies on this metric, you have to have a nearly a 20% free cash flow margin today, which is significantly higher than the 6% margin you needed back in the 1970s 
to rank in the top 20%. So our interpretation is that there are more fantastic companies today that have separated themselves by an even greater amount from the rest of the pack. And it really pays for us to focus on those fantastic businesses. One other thing to take away from this long-term trend is that smaller companies have not been able to keep pace with the large ones. We think there are a number of reasons for this, but the one we want to mention today is that we think the amount of ongoing investment required for a small company to keep up with what a large company is trying to do to improve its business is just really tough for the small company to execute. This especially is true with technological improvements. If we want to look at the banking industry, the amount of digital interactions now between customer and bank are increasing at a rapid rate, which requires a bank to have a fantastic smartphone app, for instance. And the amount of resources that a Chase Bank or Bank of America can put towards developing that app, making it really easy to use and providing a lot of functionality for the customer is going to go a longer way than what a small local bank is going to be able to try and do in competition. We're going to continue to follow this to see if the small caps end up uh, making up some of the ground that they've lost. But at this time, this is why we focus more on owning larger companies that have high cash flow margins and lower debt than you would get from a smaller company. The last thing we wanted to touch on with this subject is amazingly to us, the faster growing companies also have higher free cash flow margins. So this chart splits out the large company index into five categories based off revenue growth rate. And the fastest growing companies on the far left in the top quintile have the best margins of nearly 18%. The way we see this is if we're looking in this free cash flow margin bucket or the high margin bucket, it's going to include some high growth companies as well. And some of those companies will probably have low debt. And when we find them, now we're checking every box that we're looking for. And if we can see with those companies that the competitive advantages that they've built can be sustainable for the foreseeable future and we can get them at a good price, that's all we're looking for in trying to build out our portfolios. We walked through all of that because we think it's important to understand why we're putting such an emphasis on including these types of companies in our portfolios. An index is not going to be able to be as discerning in its stock selection because it has to own every company of a certain size. Whereas for us, we think we have an edge in that in our long-term growth and multi-cap portfolios that are unconstrained, two-thirds of the stocks in those portfolios are high margin businesses. And even in dividend growth and income opportunities are two strategies that have to invest in dividend paying companies, that nearly half of the stocks in those portfolios exhibit this characteristic, which we're pleased with considering that a lot of these high margin businesses do not pay a dividend yet. So it's a little bit tougher to find companies that fit for those strategies and yet we still have done a pretty good job. So we're pleased with how we've done this year, but we're equally excited about the potential for our strategies looking out to the rest of the decade. In a single year, there are a lot of variables that can affect the performance of the market or an individual stock. But the longer your time horizon is, the more it becomes that the growth and free cash flow per share is what's most important. We think this excellent chart from Distillate Capital is a good example of that. So it looks at the S&P 500 from the end of 2013 to the end of 2019. Over this period, the index appreciated by 75% in value. Now you may think that the valuation multiple of the S&P 500 expanded and was a big factor in that. This would be like saying that the price to earnings ratio increased by a big number. But that's not the case here. It's actually the growth in free cash flow per share that drove more than 80% of the growth in the index. Free cash flow per share grew 63% over this same time period. So if in the long run, the growth of our portfolio is going to follow the growth and the free cash flow of the companies we have in the portfolio, we think that makes it important to identify companies that can exhibit high growth years into the future while still being mindful of the price we're paying for them. The metric we like to use when we're evaluating what price we're paying is free cash flow to enterprise value yield. We prefer that over a traditional metric like price to earnings or price to book value for two reasons. First, we think free cash flow is a better representation of business performance rather than earnings per share or book value. And second, we think this is the piece that people often miss, enterprise value is a better metric than using market cap or stock price. 
because enterprise value takes into account the debt and cash on a company's balance sheet. If you think about this, if you're a private investor and you're trying to choose between two companies and you're going to purchase one of them outright, and the equity value of each company was about $100, but the first company has zero debt while the second company has $50 of debt. That $50 matters because if you pay $100 for that second company, you now assume the $50 in debt and it's your problem to try and figure out how you're going to pay it down or refinance it in the future. All we're saying is that same kind of analysis should be a factor in the public markets as well. And when we use that kind of a metric, it intrigues us that our long-term growth portfolio has nearly the same free cash flow yield as the S&P 500 which we think is great because we think we have a portfolio that can grow much faster over time than the index. So we think in a normal year, once we get past the pandemic, the free cash flow growth in our portfolio could be about 15% a year, significantly better than the 6% we would estimate for the S&P 500. If you think maybe 4% revenue growth, not much in the way of margin expansion, and maybe a 2% share buyback. And that also matches the historic growth in dividends per share for that index. We can even look at this from a more unlucky scenario and say, all right, maybe our 15% annual growth estimate was too much. And over 10 years, the growth in our portfolio's free cash flow is only about 10 or 11% per year. And say that the valuation multiples of the companies in our portfolio also contracted by about 20 or 25% over that decade. This would be like saying the price to earnings ratio fell from 20 times at the start to 15 or 16 times by the end of those 10 years. Even in that scenario, we've just outlined a portfolio that's going to deliver a high single digit total return per year over the course of 10 years, which would be an unlucky outcome for us. And we would think that'd be a pretty good outcome or about the best you could expect for the S&P 500, given where prices are today. The other reason we like this exercise is to compare the long term attractiveness between stocks and bonds. Now, bonds can have a place in any investor's portfolio especially with the portion of assets that you're trying to keep at a steady value over the next few years because you may need it for living expenses or other cash outlays. But if there's a portion of your assets you're not going to need for seven years or longer, we think that this analysis starts to show that a stock portfolio like this really starts to become more attractive. The starting point, we can compare the free cash flow yield of the stock portfolio to the corporate bond yield. And it amazes us that our free cash flow yield is higher than the bond yield because for decades this was never the case. It used to be that bond yields were way higher than free cash flow yields. But two things have changed in the last four decades. First is that bond yields have come down substantially and second, as we saw in that earlier chart, the free cash flow margin of businesses has increased by a significant amount. And starting in about 2010, a decade ago, the free cash flow yield is now about the same if not better than what you'd see from a corporate bond yield. We find this compelling because if you're a bondholder, that payout, that coupon you're going to receive is not going to increase over the life of the bond. It's going to be the same amount every year. Whereas we think the free cash flow growth of our portfolio is going to lead to our free cash flow doubling in five or seven years, which means that against the cost basis of what you paid for buying this portfolio at the start, the free cash flow yield will be above 7% in five to seven years, while the bondholder is still sitting there with 3.3%. To wrap up, we like the way that our equity strategies are arranged looking out to the rest of the decade because we think we've identified a faster growing set of businesses than you'd find in an index, while also having these companies that exhibit less risk in a recession because they carry lower amounts of debt and have higher free cash flow margins. And we're getting all of that in a package that's being bought at a similar price to what we would be paying if we bought into an index. We hope that gives you a better understanding of our investment philosophy. And if you have any questions, please contact us.